turn to Luke chapter number 9, verse number 28. This is our lectionary passage for the day. Uh, and I just want to appreciate uh, all of you who uh, came and hung out with us yesterday for our leadership meeting. Um, we are attempting to pull uh, our leaders back into formation and uh, lots of great excited folks are stepping back into some spaces. Some of you may or may not were able to attend, but we'd love to uh, welcome you to come back and sit at a table of uh, reflection and planning as we think about what does it mean uh, this is kind of going to be some of the points of my sermon to, to address the ways in which people respond to Jesus. Some folks respond to Jesus uh, as disciples. Some folks respond to Jesus through the crowds. And some folks respond to Jesus uh, via a mob. Disciples, crowds, and mobs. And I'm curious on this Palm Sunday, uh, with all that's happening in the world, uh, how can we make sense of how Jesus is literally meeting us in the course of our lives. How many of you know that one of the most greatest gifts of our literal existence is that we get to have encounters with the true and living God? Uh, it is not the case that we are making up some entity or deity, but this God has come and dwelt among us, the scripture says and has put on flesh and has left such a record that uh, there have been thousands of years of uninterrupted uh, testimony and experience. And dare I say, some of us in here may have had an experience that we know was not the figment of our own imagination. Uh, I, you know, work with a lot of folk and they say, you know, Pastor Mike, I, I've had visions that were a result of my psychedelic drugs. And I said, but there is an experience you can have that won't, won't get confused with your drugs. I wish I could talk to somebody in here. Amen. And that experience is something that I want you and I to be mindful of, particularly in a time and in a season where we are literally uh, battling for not just the soul of our nation, but I want to argue for the, the planet, the, the, the ecosystem, the world, if you will. And that is why I tell folks when Jesus says, for God so loved the world, it was not code. It was not double speak. God literally has such deep love for all of creation uh, and the specificity of your place in it that God was willing to put God's self on the line just so you could have the chance to say yes to God. What manner of love is that where God will just say, you know, I'm willing to go all the way just to give you a choice to say yes. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, God loves me that much. God loves me that much. And so Luke chapter number nine is uh, one of the most, uh, you know, powerful descriptions of the gospel of Jesus. Luke is writing with this universality in mind. Uh, if Matthew writes to the Jews and Mark writes to the Romans and John writes to his disciples, uh, Luke is literally writing to everyone. There is a universal nature of his message and all through the gospel, the stories that Luke accentuates are the stories that include everybody. Those that society would exclude because of their race, Luke would include. Those who society would exclude because of their gender, Luke would include. Those who society would exclude because of their political affiliation, Luke includes. Those who society would include because of their occupation, Romans, uh, soldiers, uh, tax collectors, uh, 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 all these kind of folks, Luke includes everybody, Samaritans, those who would be your worst enemy. Luke be including them up in there to let you know that you and I don't get to exclude anybody when it comes to the good news, that if God includes them, then who are we to say no? And I know some of us, we're a little self-righteous in here, so we never think that we will be the one excluded. But how many of you know there are some seasons in your life where you could be disqualified? Amen. I know I could. Amen. But for the grace of God. And so Luke picks up this very powerful uh, kind of pericope in Luke chapter 19. Did I say Luke 9 or 19? I meant Luke chapter 19. Sorry about that. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm missing the one in, on my paper. Oh, look, it's up here, though. So you ain't even got to do much. Amen. <laughs> you could just look behind me and see what the Lord is saying. Praise God. All right. And the scripture reads, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And as Jesus approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent 
two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying the colt? Say the Lord needs it. Amen. Jesus out here carjacking people. Praise God. Amen. Jesus sending his, his, his associates. Amen. That's kind of what it's like. You know, Jesus is like, you know, needing a ride somewhere. And he tells two of his, you know, uh, two of his little comrades. I need you to you see that little car. You see that car over there? I need you to run up in that house. <laughs> and I need you to tell them, hey, my, my master, my, 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 my OG, my OG needs, need, needs to get around. We on our way to the city today. I'm just trying to make it plain how ridiculous this story sounds. Because for some of us, we think, oh, this is so great. You know, Jesus tell them, go get, find your little coat and tell, them, tell, tell the owner of the coat, I need your coat. As if the owner don't need his own <laughs> mode of transportation. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, you know, sending his little youngsters out there to carjack or donkey jack or coat jack somebody. Amen. And, 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 but they asked first, they asked first, right? Well, well, they said, if they ask you, you give them the response. The Lord has need of it. And so those who were sent ahead and found it just as Jesus told them. And as they were stealing the colt or untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And so what is so fascinating about this story is that uh, you will always find provision where God gives you a vision. That even how ridiculous it sounds, when God puts something, an assignment in your hands to do, you may not always understand the end from the beginning, but you are serving someone who is already created the conditions for your success. For you to follow the ways of Jesus well, it is important for us to always be mindful that when God gives you and I an assignment and it does not always make sense, Jesus is the key. Jesus is the catalyst. Jesus is the answer that makes your assignment make sense. And so as they went along with Jesus' commands, uh, the scripture says they brought the colt back to Jesus. They, the disciples, threw their cloaks on the colt, put Jesus on it. And as Jesus went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Verse 37. And when Jesus came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples. This is so important. The whole crowd of disciples, somebody say disciples, began joyfully praising God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse number 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Mm hmm. And so as Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. He wept over it and said, if you, even you had only known on this day, what would bring you peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So for the next few moments, amen, I know Pastor Tanisha a couple weeks ago preached, make it make sense. Today, for Palm Sunday, we're going to talk about Jesus made it make sense. Jesus made it or makes it make sense. God, bless the word of God that has been read for us, your people. Uh, we ask you to hide your word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and let the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Somebody say Jesus made it make sense. Now, this is uh, a very, you know, fascinating 
piece of scriptural text. I'm going to try to get through here uh, relatively uh, smoothly and expeditiously, but I would like to just start off by saying that one of our greatest tasks as followers of Jesus on this Palm Sunday is to try and make sense of peace in a world of war, conflict, and violence. And matter of factly, you know, one of our challenges as followers of the Prince of Peace, right, is to follow Jesus' peaceful ways when we are constantly surrounded by less peaceful people or spaces. That whether that is in your home or on your job or in your neighborhood or at your school, certainly in our politics, in our economic spaces, in our world. We are dealing with the rise of violence that is both legitimized and some certainly that continues to be illegitimate, meaning that certain forms and modes of violence in our country, how many of you know, is generally accepted by all of us. Uh, you know, when 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 uh, you see a, 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 a injustice happening, when you see a crime happening, uh, we are often uh, given law enforcement the approval to use violence, legitimate violence. We've been watching uh, these global geopolitics play out and the aggression of Russia uh, pouring into Ukraine because of. Of, 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 of commitments that some think are viable and others think are not viable, but there is both legitimate violence being used as well as illegitimate violence being used. When we think of uh, discipline in schools, and you know, some of us, you know, have worked with children, praise God, who, you know, they push you to the bounds of all that is humanly possible to receive and take without you yourself losing your mind. And so, you know, there is legitimate violence in the sense of discipline and suspension that, you know, when done with equity may not be so violent, but interestingly enough, in our schools, there is such an inequitable application of discipline that even when it is used as a tool of self-correction, it still comes out as violence. Or in this country, we have, uh, you know, redlining, right? Where, you know, banks have historically uh, pilfered and, 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 and excluded total communities from accessing capital, whereby it perpetuates poverty that is violence. And we go along with it for the most part. But then there is an illegitimate violence, right, where a police officer kills an unarmed person and everybody gets really bent out of shape. Or a person is violated physically, emotionally, uh, uh, and, and other ways by, by folk who have, you know, terrible moral formation or trauma that is pouring out in ways that harm and we rightly get upset. Or we just know that there are certain modes of reacting to the trauma in our lives, in other people's lives, and the violence, even though it happens, we know that that is not legitimate. Part of our task, people of God, is to navigate what does it mean to be a person of peace in the midst of a violent world, in the midst of your own violent ecosystems, and I find this message to be so important because just last weekend we were uh, at the Riverside Church and we were uh, reading Dr. King's uh, uh, Break the Silence speech about, about uh, the Vietnam War. And, and he was talking about the triplets of evil, militarism and racism and, and uh, economic exploitation or capitalism, poverty, and, 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 and this idea that that we must defeat these triplets of evil. But Dr. King in his speech powerfully said, as we defeat these triplets of evil, we must do a full examination of the ways of peacemaking as our primary mode of defeating evil. And I have been thinking about this particularly on this 
this this season as we move into resurrection because I look at the life of Jesus as paradigmatic for us of what it means to defeat evil using the ways of peace. To be people who are constantly asking and reminding ourselves, God, how would you have me pursue peace in the midst of violence and death? You see, if the return of Jesus is the demonstration of his resurrection power, the entry of Jesus, this triumphant moment of Palm Sunday is the pathway Jesus lays out for you and I to receive both personal and social salvation in that Jesus decides as I am going to my death, because let's remember, it's not like Jesus and the disciples were jacking somebody's ride to go on a joy ride. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Not like they was going on like a fantastic, we going on a cross country trip. We taking, we taking this coat and we going to ride out. No, they're literally riding in to the belly of the beast. They are riding into harm's way. This is the radical nature of Jesus in that Jesus is not running away from his moment of potential and worst painful defeat. Jesus is confidently riding into it. Why? Because Jesus has become so particularly clear that as the world seeks victory through violence and death, I am going to secure salvation through peace and sacrificial living. And I want a child of God how transformative it would be if you and I actually use Jesus as the, the key to unlock the nonsensical nature of violence in our world. The violence that has become so ubiquitous, the violence that makes sense to us. I mean, here in this country, we have hundreds of millions of guns that are now unaccountable because we don't do background checks. They're mailing guns now to people over the internet. You don't even have to, have to, have to prove you are a person. You can just buy a gun and make the gun online. They call these guns ghost guns. And these ghost guns have flooded into our communities during the age of COVID because so much money has flown into our communities through some of these programs. And folks have used scams and, and fraud to literally arm themselves to a teeth. Yet, we are supposed to be the most Christian country in the world. But we are also the most armed country in the world. During our time, we were talking about how the United States government has literally given more than 25 to 30 billion dollars above what the Pentagon, the defense budget was asking for this year. I said, didn't we just end our war in Afghanistan? Why are we getting 25 to 30 more billion dollars? So think about this. We as a country, civilians, are the most armed in the world. We are arming half of the countries of the world, and yet we have homelessness. You ride down any street in a major metropolitan city, and you have tent cities spiking up, not because people are not working, not because people don't have a steady income. It's because we have literally created legitimized violence through pushing people out into the streets while we are securing might through weapons. And this is the juxtaposition I want you to think of. Why? Because Jesus was living in the modern day United States of America in this text. Jesus was literally trying to uh, liberate uh, the mind, the spirit, the soul, the bodies of a people who were living under the thumb of the empire. And all of these folks following Jesus were expecting that Jesus, as he rides into Jerusalem, as he fulfills 
the prophecy of the scriptures. Because when you look at verse number 37, where you hear the Mount of Olives, or if you look at verse number 29, when it talks about Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, the children of Israel, the Jewish folks, those words, those places had significant meaning. It was like their Alamo if you will. It was like their battle at the Valley Forge, if you will. In their minds, as Jesus is making a triumphant entry into Jerusalem, coming through the Mount of Olives, the, the, the Jewish folk who are oppressed are saying, oh my goodness, this is the moment we've been waiting for. We about to, we, it's, about to, it's about to turn up. It, it, we revolutionaries. We got all the. How many? Know, how many know some revolutionaries? They, they may be like social media revolutionaries, revolutionaries, in the, right? People who are always talking about, man. If I was alive during this time, I would do this. And man, why we just turn up, man? Why, man? I ain't gonna vote. I'm just, man. We just go do this, and then, and then, you know, Jesus comes on the scene, and he starts talking that talk, and it kind of starts tickling your ears. Like, is Jesus the one? Is Jesus about that life? <laughs> is it, man? What? G G what? And, and Jesus been been healing folk. He been he been he been multiplying fishes and loaves, doing miracles. And so all these folk is looking at Jesus on the side, like, okay, Jesus, you you we've been waiting on the Messiah. We've been making one revolutionary, and you talking about you gonna tear something up and and build it back in three days. Oh yeah, Jesus did. Jesus he he comes into the Mount of Olives. This is the military outpost in the Jewish imagination that the way they're going to be free from Rome is to have a military Messiah come down through the Mount of Olives and all of a sudden you see Jesus in the high, in the distance riding on a donkey. He's like, oh snap! It's about to go down! They getting ready. They cleaning out their little spears and their little, little, little pistols. They didn't have pistols, whatever they had back then. They getting their shields ready. Oh, Jesus, we about to go to war. And then Jesus throws a little wrench in their plan. How many know Jesus knows how to throw a wrench in your plans? You be looking for Jesus to do one thing. And you getting all ready. Oh, yeah, Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. And then Jesus says, okay, let's go this way. No, Jesus, no, 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 not, no. No, Jesus, we going this way. Anybody ever, heard, anybody ever told Jesus you going the wrong way? Jesus, this is not the right way, Jesus. I'm trying to be free. Jesus like, oh, I'm going to set you free. But I'm going to set you free from some stuff you didn't know was truly keeping you in bondage. I'm going to set you free with some tools that you didn't know were at your disposal. I'm going to train your hands to fight this fight differently. Because the tools, uh, here, uh, uh, is that a sada that says, is that a sada that says that you can't dismantle the master's house using the same tools? Who is that? Audrey Lord, one of them revolutionary sisters, amen. Right? Jesus is literally telling that message to them. Jesus is bad, y'all. Like Jesus said this before, you know, since the Lord wrote it down. Y'all think a revolution is coming this way, but you can't overthrow this kind of wickedness with horses and chariots and bombs. Why? Because some of the very people you feel you must kill are actually the ones who need the same liberation as you. Could, could you believe, could you appreciate that part of why we follow Jesus is because Jesus even wants to help liberate some of our oppressors. Not through you having to sacrifice yourself. I'm not one of these folks to believe that in order for your oppressor to be delivered, that you got to be the sacrificial lamb. I don't believe in that. I believe by your faithfulness, some shackles are going to fall off of some folk. Just by you loving well and you serving well, right? You dealing with the dissonance that happens. Friends Fernand, I love this quote and I, 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 I use it a little bit here and there, but Friends Fernand says sometimes people hold a core belief that is very strong and when they're presented with evidence that works against that belief, the new evidence cannot be accepted. It would create a feeling that is extremely uncomfortable called cognitive dissonance. 
Hmm. And because it is so important to protect your core belief, they will rationalize, ignore and even deny anything that doesn't fit in with their core belief. And I know this and many other writings like this are often used to, to try to destabilize and cause you to doubt your faith. But I want you to, 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 to apply it in a different way this morning. I want you to think about the kind of cognitive dissonance that the, the, the Palm Sunday experience of Jesus creates for the would-be follower of Jesus in a world of war. That we who have been taught that the only way to win is to harm other people. That the only way to get power is to conquer other people. That the only way to be protected is to literally have uh, instruments of death within your reach. That that cognitive dissonance that is created in the heart of the follower of Jesus is what actually causes you to not be powerful in the spirit of the living God. Because your power and your strength is in your weapon and not in your God. Your power and your strength is in your position and not with your God. Your power and your strength is not in the word of God. That is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. But it's in the constitution or it's in the ideology or it's in the, the degree from your university that teaches you death itself but gives you a degree for mastering it. I'm here to tell you that some of us better get familiar with the ways of God. Because this is what Jesus said. If you only knew what made for peace, you wouldn't even be fooling around with this fake revolutionary stuff. Oh, I'm here to tell you, it's easy to blow up something. But how many know it's harder to build something and keep things alive? That's why certain political forces in this country are so attractive to those without hope and imagination. For those who can just other folks and, and exclude folks, it's easy to leave people out that you don't like. Lord knows I got a long list of them. <laughs> I'd be like, Lord, if you just get rid of them and them and them and them, oh, then my life would be great. But then I, I realized I may be on somebody's list as well. So imagine I'm praying for this person to be eliminated. That person's praying for me. Aren't you glad God don't answer some of your prayers? You better be thankful. <laughs> I wish I had somebody to talk to up in here. You better be thankful God says no to some of the stuff you pray. You better be thankful God says, oh, baby, you don't know what you're talking about. You just need to keep on praying. Mm -hmm. Just keep on praying. Keep on fasting. Why? Because you have not yet learned the ways of peace. And because you've not learned the ways of peace, none of this makes sense to you. None of this makes sense to you. But if you keep following after my ways, if you keep surrendering to my truths, if you keep following me down the path that I have hewn out for you, you'll see that you won't be a mob when you are called to be a disciple. You won't get locked in the crowd. When you're called to be a disciple. What is a disciple? A disciple is someone who makes an intentional choice without force or coercion. To follow the path and the example set before them. I'm here to tell you I am a disciple probably 80 some percent of the week. <laughs> Amen. So there be some moments where I just, you know, the, the crowd and the mob, it just be getting the best of me. Amen. I'm the preacher. I'm just going to tell you the truth because I want to get to heaven one day. Amen. Ain't no, ain't no, what they say? Ain't no, ain't no, ain't no need of you fronting. Amen. Tell your neighbor, stop fronting up in here. Amen. You know, you know, you be with the mob. Some of them. <laughs> Come on, Elshay. You know, you be mobbing out some days. Be like, oh, don't be fooling me today. Amen. I know I'm following Jesus, but today's a rough day. <laughs> Somebody say Amen. Amen. I believe in nonviolence. Just don't push me. Ain't that your amen? That's, that's your theological <laughs> commitment. Amen. Just don't talk about my mama. We're going to be all right. Don't step on my Jordans. We're going to be all right. Man, don't talk about the Raiders or the Warriors or whoever y'all be roofed and we're going to be all right. But the moment you start getting in the wrong vicinity, amen. I, someone told me I had to put my Jesus on a, on a little shelf for the day. How many of you know we need more disciples 24 hour a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year? Disciples 
One, one proposal for world peace was said that if Christians would just make a commitment not to kill other Christians, we would have world peace. And I'm here to tell you, wouldn't it be something if every follower of Jesus in the world said, I will not kill another person. I can't talk about the Muslims. I can't talk about the Buddhists. I can't talk about the agnostics, the post-religious folk, the, 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 the transcendentalists. I can't talk about, you know, the energy filling rock hugging tree hugging. I can't talk about none of them because this church ain't for them. Amen. Although you're welcome to hang out. Praise God. But I'm just talking about you who say you. How many of you say you follow Jesus? Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. And that's an old song. We used to sing. Y'all don't know that song. But it's to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Then another verse says, though no, though no one fo comes or follows, still I will follow. Though none come with me. See, just take a minute. Janera, why you ain't helping me over there, brother? Amen. Though none come with me, still I will follow. We sing all these songs. Amen. Mm. Amen. But we'll kill another person in a heartbeat and make a whole bit. Well, you know, they came up in on, my, on my property. I told them don't come up on my property now. Oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the military, you know, we, we, we serving in the same, you know, I got, you know, they, the, the government tell me to go point this gun and shoot, I got to go do it. Oh, you know, I'm from Hunters Point, they from Fillmore, I'm from, I'm, 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 I'm from, I'm from Ghost Town, they from the east, east side, you know, I, so, so, you know, I, I just born into it, pastor. And you don't want to know what's the deepest thing about this? When you have a funeral. We all will have a funeral at the same kind of church, praying to the same Jesus to welcome the same person into eternity. And I know Jesus be like, man, I don't want y'all jokers up in here with me. What y'all gonna come to heaven for? Y'all die, y'all. Yeah, you better leave your pistol. I'm, no, Jesus be like, I'm glad when you get down there in that grave, you can't come up to heaven with these guns y'all got. Because there's peace up here in heaven. What if Christians just said, we will not kill another person? Think of all the peace we could make in the world. Think of all the peace we can make in the town, in the city, in, 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 in the Crest, in Richmond, in Vallejo, in, in the whole region. I, think of what would happen if we in this church just said, I'm not going to kill another person. I'm not going to strike another person. I'm not going to diminish and dehumanize another person. Why? Because I am trying to follow the king of kings who rode into the belly of the beast on a donkey saying, listen, I am the way, the truth. And the life disciples make conscious decisions to follow Jesus. The crowds, listen, I'm, 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 I'm gonna wrap up because I, I don't preach my time away. But the crowds, the crowds are conscious of Jesus, but they're not willing to make no sacrifices. So they love Jesus. Jesus come around. Oh, here comes Jesus. Oh, he sure talk good. Who <laughs> that Jesus? Who that Jesus? Boy, he sure know how to say it. Ain't that Jesus good? Come on, let's let's sit down. Let's listen to the lecture of Jesus. Oh, yeah, Jesus, love your neighbor. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We, that is some great rhetoric. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, I got the love. I, mm -hmm. What? Did, yeah, forget. Oh, man, that Jesus, he's so eloquent. Oh, yes. Then Jesus asked you to do something like, well, Jesus, well, you know, I've, <laughs> it, was, it was a great, it was a great talk. Jesus show up healing folk. Oh, yes, I need to go. Come on, let's go see if, if, I, can, if I can get pull the ticket for who's going to get healed today. I heard Jesus healing folk. Oh, yeah, I, Jesus, Jesus feeding folk. Oh, come on, Jesus, he, he put a good little, little fish sandwich, fish and chips together, praise God. I'm, I'm going to hang out with Jesus today. You following Jesus because you like Jesus' words. You like the fishes and the loaves. You like the miracles. But when it comes to Jesus asking you to do hard things... No, Jesus, no, Jesus, come on now, Jesus. We got to live in the real world, Jesus. I be telling Jesus this sometimes. I was up in the White House. I'm dealing with some wicked folk. 
And some folk that make me want to go like to the Godfather type of way of dealing with things. You know, you ever met some folk? They just make you turn you into a Machiavellian, masoch masochistic. You just sitting around trying to figure out how to catch them on the causeway. Wish I could talk to somebody up in here. I'm talking about wicked folk that you feel like this Jesus thing ain't going to work with them. <laughs> they, need, they need somebody to take them out. And I be dealing with these folk. I want you to know. And Jesus be talking to me. <laughs> Mike, I know you. You little, be a little riled up today. But you got to learn the ways of peace. You got to let me fight some of these battles. Anybody ever had them kind of conversation? I'll be telling you now. Y'all be thinking, you know, Pat, he's so nice. I used to be nice. And then these wicked folk, they turn you into something else. But that's why you got to be in your disciplines. Hello, somebody. How many ever been, been a part of something that turned you into something you didn't even recognize anymore? You used to be sweet as pie. Now you as sour as that, that, that candy they sell at the, at the, at the movie show, <laughs> the picture show. <laughs> the crowds conscious of the ways of Jesus but you're not willing you're not willing to go all the way as long as this thing benefits my sensibilities I'm 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 a, I'm a show up and then the mob God save us from the mob within ourselves those violent tendencies and dispositions that that hover deep I mean not some some is a little more deeper than others how many know some of us, the mob personality inside of us is bare, buried in a shallow grave? It just take a little. <laughs> and you, you like the undertaker, like sitting up like, you know, oh, what's going on? Some of whose who head need to be rolled today. Lord, help us. Help us to have you so at the center of our lives that it makes sense to be a peacemaker. What is the difference between a conquering hero? Start playing because I, I need to stop. <laughs> what is the difference between a conquering hero and a liberating savior? Conquering heroes use violence. Liberating saviors use peace and healing. Ask yourself, what do you, you, what do you, what lineage are you in? Conquering heroes amass power for themselves. They're power hungry. I feel like the only way for them to get their way is to seduce and, and scheme on your job, in your family, in your relationships. But liberating saviors. They believe that there are more sources of freedom available outside of your own reach. And those sources of freedom can free other people. Conquering heroes require adoration as penance for their gift of victory. The liberating saviors evoke worship, meaning it just happens without them even asking because they're worthy of it. And I want you, child of God, as we go into Holy Week, to ask yourself, am I following conquering heroes or is my life being shaped by a liberating savior? A God who is great, a God who is worthy of all praise, a God who invites me to follow after the ways of peace. Why is this such an important message? Because child of God, you cannot attain peace if you are full of violence. It will be elusive to you. If you think that the only way for you to have power is to be violent and take it from other folk, you will always be powerless. There are people with a lot of power, but don't have any power at all. They can cause a lot of harm to other people, but they are digging a ditch for themselves. 
So don't pursue after the paradoxical expressions of power in this world. Pursue the things that make for peace and trust and believe that I'm following this Jesus. Hosanna. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. I'm coming in the name of the Lord. Anyone want to come in the name of the Lord? I, I don't, I don't want to be an instrument of violence in a world that is literally falling in on itself. Because I got news for you. I'm not claiming to be a prophet. I hope I'm wrong. But we are watching the implosion of this empire called the United States of America. It's falling in on itself. It's falling in on itself. We who live in California can't fully appreciate it because we in California, although let a big earthquake happen and all of our services get disrupted and we'll see the scarcity and the miss and the, 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 the broken systems. We already see folk living outside in the wealthiest region of this country. Things are already falling apart. And many of us, we, 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 we on that, we on that, what's that thing, the hamster, that hamster wheel. We running. We, we hope if I just keep running fast enough, it won't be me. But I got good news for you. People always outlast empires. Huh. <laughs> Did you know that? The Romans ain't around no more. I mean, the Roman Empire ain't around no more, but the people who were in the Roman Empire, they still around. Uh-huh, the Syrian Empire ain't around no more, but guess what? The people in the Syrian Empire are still around. The United States may not be around in perpetuity, but the people of the land, the ones whom God loved so much, that God gave God's only self, only son. So whoever believes will never perish. Aren't you glad that people will never perish? Systems may fall, but people outlast systems. And that's why the church will always stand. Come on, let's stand to our feet, everyone. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great, how great is our God. Lift those hands, take your palms and just wave them, come on. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God all will see how great how great is our God he has a name above all names come on sing name above all names he's worthy to be praised be praised and my heart will sing my heart will sing how great is our God. Come on, take your palm and wave it in the air. How great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Come on, just keep waving those palms in the air. God, we join the disciples. The disciples who saw you coming, riding on the back of a donkey, a lowly and humble entry into the magnificence of our lives. We wave these palms today, welcoming you. Somebody say, God, you're welcome. Come on, say it again. God, you're welcome. God, we welcome you into our lives today. We welcome you as a people who are not fully conscious or aware of every step you're taking. But we know, God, that you are able. You're able, Lord God, to teach us the ways of peace. You're able to bring healing into our lives and into our families, into our communities. And so, God, we welcome you. Somebody say, God, you're welcome.
Come on, say it again. God, you're welcome. Make a triumphant entry into our heart today. Arrest our will, oh God. Help us to unlearn violence. Help us to unlearn retribution. Help us to be set free from fear and wicked, evil plans of the wicked. And I pray, God, that you will teach us. God, that you will open up new ways to defeat the enemies of our lives. So, God, we say yes to you. Somebody say yes, Lord. Come on, just say it again. Yes, Lord. Somebody say, Hosanna. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Heal us, oh God. Strengthen us, oh God. Set us free. And save us, oh God. Save us from this fallen world. These systems, oh God, that are polluting our minds, our bodies, our spirit, the soil and all creation. Save us from, Lord God, the violence in the world, the wars and the rumors of war. God, we pray for peace in Ukraine, but we also pray for peace, oh God. In places like Yemen, oh God, in places like Palestine and Brazil, places like East Oakland and, and, and Richmond, places, oh God, in, in, in Vallejo and in the Tenderloin, God, in Hunter's Point, we pray for peace in our own streets. So God, I pray that you will do a great work and a mighty work in the name of Jesus. And we'll say thank you, Lord. We'll say thank you, Lord. Thank you for peace. Thank you for hope. And thank you for strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, clap your hands, everybody. And give the Lord a hand praise today. We bless the Lord. We bless the Lord. We bless the Lord.